part of what fathers provide is this sort of teasing wit, this sort of sense of humor, this sort of energy, this sense of adventure, this recklessness, maybe. That the dad is more likely to say, well, what did you do? What do you think you can do that's different next time? What did you do? What did you do? Uh, so I'm just poking a little bit and just seeing. And, uh, so it's, it can be fun, but I think it's the learning that you get that, oh, I can track it better. I can, I, I can, I might have made up a wrong opinion of something, but let me try another way and say, oh, yeah, yeah, it, it is actually like that. They're, they're just constantly rewriting. Or they really want to learn. They really want to do it. They, in earnest, want to um, go through it properly. So in that way, it's an invitation. So I, I would not uh, exclude anyone, like in, in my headspace, like, because it's, <laughs> it's just an opportunity to, you know, do that. The group has advanced to the point where the group can review past meetings. So they can watch, uh, rewatch meetings where people get triggered, they get triggered, and then they can learn from exposure. And meltdowns. <laughs> and meltdowns. Or be entertained by it. But uh, it's not as traditional, even though a lot of uh, more advanced therapies use what video footage where the therapist watches what they do and the client can so they can improve on it. Just like in sports where you watch film. What did you do? So the sports athletes can see an objective measure of what happened. What did you do? And then you can track or improve upon stuff. Sometimes you get into a flashback and you, you don't see things clearly. What did you do? So if you have some sort of historical document or video footage, you can revisit it. And then you can uh, figure out what really happened and what your memory is. And you can try to integrate those flashbacks. What did you do? Some groups, they almost worship your story to the point that it's untouchable, but then if we worship your story and you have cognitive distortions and you have beliefs that are self-defeating, unproven, or beliefs where you put all the blame on someone else and then you're stuck until they change, then that would be enabling uh, you being stuck. Well, it's funny you say that. <clears throat> um, one of the best lines I heard in the last couple of months was... Um, when you blame when you blame others, you haven't learned. When you blame yourself, you're learning. When you blame no one, you've learned. I don't know how truth that is, but oh, the final one is when you blame no one, you've learned. Ooh. Don't know. Yeah, it's, that's I, it's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around around that, considering a <laughs> life can throw you some curveballs. That's for sure. So, but uh, we'll see. I guess. You want to explore that since you flew it out here? <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah, pick on the new guy, right? Yeah. Um, to be quite honest with you, I, I, it was told to me, so um, I, I really have no experience on that that aspect. I think uh, self. How much do you agree with it? <laughs> um, to be honest with you, I think self reflection is something I've always taken first in a situation that has gone negative or toxic to see what my part <clears throat> in that situation is to say, okay, wh where, where have I gone wrong here? Um, but I think a lot of times, 99.999% of the times people um, look to blame others regardless. So I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, so I really don't know how much truth there is to that statement, but uh... well, this came up in person. I tried to give the metaphor of the second arrow. So, if you're in war, I think maybe it's a Buddhist story, and then you get shot by an arrow from the enemy. And you have injury because you have an arrow, right? It's stuck in you. And then you can obsess about where the arrow came from, who shot it at you, how to protect yourself from the next arrow. But you still got an arrow on you, right? 
<laughs> you have a giant injury in your body, and uh, whose responsibility is to heal that wound? <laughs> right. Great point. How much sense would it make if you're in warfare, you have an arrow stuck on you, and then you go around chasing for the who to blame, and you want them to do all the work to heal the arrow on you? Great analogy. Right? So, <laughs> as an adult, we can't really go cry to a parent or cry to someone else to take care of responsibility. <laughs> if we have our house out of order because it's unfair someone did it, we still have to go be responsible to fix the house, to take care of our body. We can blame. It helps us prevent maybe getting in the next arrow. But right now, if you're carrying a wound from your parents or whoever, your spouse, uh, whoever your abuser is, chasing after them to heal your wound is probably not a um, wise investment of energy. No question. No question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it can be a distraction from dealing with your own stuff. So sometimes you can just obsess about the childhood you didn't have and how bad you were making this mistake, this decision and that decision, but you're avoiding this giant infected wound inside of your body. So that's where the, the last part, what, when you blame no one, you've learned. So blame is good, but now if there's a fucking problem, if you have a giant wound, if you're bleeding to death, that's more important than trying to figure out who did it. Yeah. Great analogy. Great point. See? See how wise you are? Have you figured it out? Do you have any theories of why you were so blindsided, what you didn't see, or what you were... You trusted too much? How, how would you summarize your blindsidedness? What did you do? What did you do? Well, I've always looked at generosity as the strength, not a weakness. Um, okay. So did you see her as a... Uh, what did you do? Someone to sympathize with and rescue yeah. or a broken yeah. person or something? Yeah. Was that yeah like, no, it was actually me. No, you're, it's a great point. It's actually me um maybe it's a sense of feeling sorry for them to help them oh felt sorry and, for and, them okay, but but for you wouldn't say that at the time but looking back at it now when you get away from that situation most definitely so so you wanted to help her out you saw her as being shunned unfairly or hurt so that made you more generous. Okay, could you summarize your blind spot? What did you do? Maybe we could pivot off that. Or when you were blindsided, what was oh, the big thing? It only took a matter of three days for that to occur. Um, it, it, was, it was literally a planned agenda on an exit strategy that everything in my life was being ultimately destroyed at once so it didn't All allow it wasn't like just one thing it was it, yeah it just wasn't one thing it was multiple things with charges time to blow up oh like yeah okay yeah that surprised you no question you didn't see it coming yeah so you had a hunch and you were planning on leaving the relationship once she found out, then she had her exit plan or attack plan to blow up all the stuff. Is that um, a summary? Does that match? Yeah, I didn't. Okay. So why were you going to leave the relationship? What was your hunch about her? What red flags or what issues did you start to see? Oh, noticing? man. Okay, so now I'm in the corner here. Um, she's suicidal. <laughs> oh, did she use suicidal as a threat, or how? What, what kind of cool suicidal ideation did she share? Uh, standing at the edge of the the bed with a knife, saying she's going to kill herself if I leave her. At the edge of the bed. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was. Great. Oh, she woke you up with that. That must have been like pretty surprising. I've never had that. Uh, That'd be more... exciting. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. 
like a giant knife, and how did she threaten to kill herself? Oh man! Slashing her throat or wrist or stabbing you, killing both. What, no, what was the detail? She realized that she was putting me through too much, and she she hated her life. She didn't she didn't want to. And I think she couldn't. So she was realizing how much of a burden she was on you, and she hated her life. So she announced she wanted to kill herself, waking up in the middle of the night at the end of the bed. Is that sort of the situation? Yeah, like, uh, obviously. Wow. Uh-huh. Yeah, so. How do you take that in from your perspective? Uh, I'm seeing a therapist over it. That's how I'm taking it in. <laughs> yeah, How's that's that? kind of fucked up, right? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know how much else to, to put it out there, but... Uh, I've never seen violence of rage from someone and then 10 minutes later come back and say, I love you. I'm sorry. I can't live without you. And oh, then, so she, 10 minutes later, she would apologize and yeah. give you a different story. Like, I love you. Tell You're me, so great. Tell me, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh. You know, I'm the air that she breathes. I can't live without you. You're the most amazing person in my life. I'm You're my sorry. favorite person. You're most most important person. Stuff like that. Mm. And you had trouble making sense of this. So in one moment, she's threatening to kill herself. And it's all because she's putting you through so much and she feels guilty and her life is horrible. And then 10 minutes later, she apologizes and says you're the greatest thing in the world and you're supposed to make sense of that well that situation there i i, I was actually fearing for my life for a second and then i just said okay i gotta calm this situation down by trying to comfort her and then she broke down and she was going to make sure she was going to just try to destroy everything in my life because of scorched that. earth yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've never dealt with scorched earth tactics? Not to this extent, no. Oh. You had a very lucky childhood, maybe. So you were blindsided by her intensity and her suicidal uh, threats and her mood swings. Uh, and then when you wanted your space, then that maybe triggered her abandonment terror, and then that led to this scorched earth destruction? Is that uh, yeah, sort of what happened? I would pretty well agree with that. Yeah. So let's see if we can explore some relational trauma angle, maybe. So we could broaden it or give you a different context instead of just your story. So this is Terry Real. He's a couples therapist who sometimes works with trauma. Um, well, us therapists have to deal with this relational trauma, little t trauma, this relational trauma. So sometimes trauma, big t trauma, is uh, more popular and more exciting and more talked about. But little t relational trauma is sometimes uh, overlooked. Or it's sometimes it's harder to, to process through because it's a bit more abstract. It's not as clear cut. Uh, betrayal, trust, moral injury. Uh, it's a different type of issue. So, uh, it's, it deserves its own category, but sometimes it's hard to address. That is not about an overwhelming catastrophic event. That's about a relational theme that gets repeated over and over and over again. It's relational trauma. Catastrophic event happens once. That you can't talk to somebody happens a million times over 18 years. It's relational trauma. Let me give you an example. While they both have terrible trauma histories, she puts up a wall uh, and he gets aggressive and starts pounding, trying to pound it down. Or he gets aggressive and she puts up a wall. You can punctuate it either way. 
I say to her, uh, when does the wall come down? And she says, well, when days go by and it calms down and he's soft and he's gentle, then we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. So that's the solution. L let's see if we can make that happen in a matter of minutes, not days. So now I move to him. Why is he so aggressive? I say to him, um, I don't know. I'm making this up. But I'll bet on the other side of her wall, there's a little boy in you that feels really abandoned and shut out and helpless. And he goes, bingo. And I go, bingo. Tell me what happened to you. And he goes, well, I was abused as a child. He never said this to his partner. I say, how were you abused sexually? Tell me about it. It was my aunt. What happened? It went on for about four months, about six incidents, blah, 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 blah. How old were you? Seven. Who did you tell? No one. Why not? I don't think they would have done much. How do you feel on the other side of that wall? And he says, I feel like I don't matter. I feel like there's no one there. I feel like no one cares. I feel like there's no one to tell my story to. Literally, he used those words. So catastrophic trauma, his aunt being sexually abusive to him on three or four specific occasions. That's catastrophic trauma. Does he have to debrief from that? Absolutely. But what about the trauma of not having anybody to tell? That wasn't three or four times. That was millions of times. And guess what? When he's behind uh, this person's wall, his girlfriend's wall, the aggression isn't because he's being violated. The aggression is because he's being shut out. He's being shut out. He's being shut out. He is not uh, being triggered by his aunt's catastrophic activity. He's being triggered by his family's pervasive chronic neglect. And that's the kind of relational trauma that most of us encounter every day in our offices. Pervasive chronic neglect. Relational trauma. Neglect. Relational trauma. Neglect. Neglect. Relational trauma. The aggression of being shut out. So if this partner of Steve's was shunned by her church or family, then she might be oversensitive to being shut out. She no might question. be oversensitive no question. to yeah. being abandoned. So Yeah, that's what she would say all the time is the fear of abandonment. My life is now being punished because she feared that abandonment and I was going to abandon her. But I, I couldn't help her. Mm -hmm. Well, it's hard it to leave somebody or get away from, get your own space for somebody who's had a history of being shunned and her traumas around that. So then she might be grasping on you to, onto you a bit too much. And then that naturally would make you want to get some space. But then she's taking that as abandonment terror, right? Yeah. Mm. Hang on. And you didn't know how to deal with someone with abandonment terror. I I was I she burnt me out. I, I mean <laughs> I I mean let, let me tell you uh, the Cathlon Marathon. You name it. Uh, I I did everything I could. Just burnt me out. All the other Body aspects. Lama thirties. Uh, how would you say your father was as far as being a father figure role model? Uh, my dad was aces. Um, my aces. father, yeah, he was he was a stand stand up guy. Yeah. yeah, but how was he as far as mentoring you? Or it's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when they got divorced, how was that relationship? 
Uh, he he's still actually he was the one that 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 um, probably turned more to the alcohol. Um, he was more of a functioning alcoholic, but um, mm. but uh, but still but still still a great father. Still, he wasn't a mad person. He wasn't an abusive person. But he had to retreat to an addiction to manage his stress, or uh, yeah, I would something. say so. Yeah, right? which I've never had that issue myself. I've never turned to alcohol or drugs for for relief in life. So your father, otherwise, is uh, perfect. Well, I don't know about anyone's perfect, but yeah, he was a pretty good role model. He was a pretty stable guy. Yeah, he's a very patient man. Yeah. Oh, very patient. So did you yeah. ever see him use anger? Not very not very often, no. Oh. So what's your position on um discipline leadership? exploration struggle well as a in, father it, uh to have as much time as possible um i find that it it, it hasn't been easy um at the beginning but then getting involved in a relationship like this is definitely set it back tenfold um, Set it back tenfold. Okay. Yeah, because of the the legal aspect. Now, now I temporarily can't see my son here for a few months. Uh, you can't see him now. When you see him, how do you maximize your presence? Absolutely, as much as that it's allowing me to be here. Yeah. And what do you think you provide as a father versus a mother? How are, how is your energy different? I don't think it's, I don't think it's really that much different. I think uh, my son gets lots of, lots of love and attention from both sides. There's no, I've never once said anything negative about his mom or as far as I know, vice versa. So. My, my son's not an angry child or growing up in a hostile environment or, you know, that, not to, to my knowledge. I'm trying to get some heat, but I'm struggling. <laughs> Let's see how this video lands since I'm just trying to get the father space. Children, dads teasing children, and which feels to many moms like it often results in the child crying. Um, but it begins to teach the child a whole series of skill sets. What tones of voice are teasing or playfulness? I wanted them always to stay on the funny side of teasing, because teasing can easily turn into torture, and so they had to learn these extremely fine gradations of humor. And to do that, they had to play on the edge. And the question is how necessary is it to have the capacity to allow your children to play on the edge okay maybe that's what's been missing <laughs> play on the edge play on the edge so when i'm talking to steve back and forth there is something missing so this ability to play on the edge and that sort of life force by being at the edge play on the edge seems flat in my opinion in other Sorry. people's opinion uh, flat in what sense Play on the edge. It doesn't have that dynamism. Play on the edge. So we'll play more of this and then you can evaluate yourself. Yeah. It's okay. just a theory. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No and worries. And fathers have that by temperament more than mothers do. Um, so, so I'm trying to tease out what fathers provide and what mothers provide. And part of what fathers provide is this sort of teasing wit, this sort of sense of humor. Play on the edge. This sort of energy, this sense of adventure, this play on the edge, recklessness, maybe. And something triggers something that is 
very specific, the child will tend to sort of open up on his or her own terms. <clears throat> and interestingly, I said hangout time was very important for boys. It's the single greatest predictor of psychological security in girls, hangout time with dads. That the dad is more likely to say, well, you know, what did you do? Uh, that maybe was not um, so good as a goalie. Uh, what do you think you can do that's different with it with the uh, with the coach next time? Children, that's more of a problem solving approach. Or a problem. And you think that's associated with a positive developmental consequence for IQ? There are so many um, developmental advantages to a lot of the things that dads do, but I want to really make it clear that dads don't say to moms things like. I'd like to roughhouse with the children because it will increase the children's empathy. I'd like to tease with the children because it will increase their social abilities to, to have to play. Right, God, who could stand to be married to someone who did that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted the kids to be inoculated against casual insult. You, you have to take that with a sense of humor or, or it just mounts. I've seen people who can't respond to that initial testing because people want to socialize with people who are about as socialized as them. And There's sort of a craziness to male energy. Play on the edge. Or father energy that's playful and dangerous and reckless. That's going to look for the problem to solve. And What did you do? What did you do? What did you do? It's edgy. So, Steve, when you were going back and forth, did you... Play on the edge. think it was an edgy dynamic conversation or is it sort of just flat? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I, I think it's, I don't think I'm a flat person <clears throat> in life. Um, sure. I'm not saying you're a flat person in life no. as far as the energy. <laughs> well, right now in my life, yeah, I'm probably pretty flat, but normally I'm pretty, oh. I'm pretty usually a happy go lucky, sarcastic type of guy. But generally, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you were maybe sarcastic before you got emotionally uh, drained. <laughs> Post-betrayal yeah. and your life being destroyed. Blindsided, all whatever stuff. you want to label all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And you're sort of flatter or less... Oh, definitely. Yeah, mm. definitely. Oh, yeah. Immensely. Yeah. Let's see what else is on this video. Maybe it might inspire me. I'm not sure. So what they'll do first is throw out some teasing and see what happens. And if it evokes a playful response, then they know that the person that they're dealing with can be relied on to play and has been reasonably socialized. Uh, um, the commerce of masculinity is the, the trading of wit-covered put-downs. The, the trading of wit-covered put-downs. Wit-covered put-downs. So the commerce of masculinity is a trading of wit-covered put-downs. Wit-covered put-downs. How does that land for you, Steve? Uh, sorry, like, you mean me putting somebody down or? No, the statement, <clears throat> the generalization that the commerce of masculinity is with covered put downs. Uh, well, men can be in that common sense. You put, put a man full of room and you got a lot of testosterone. So someone's going to come out as the weak link in the fence or the, or sorry, the weak link in the chain. So. So that's how you translate the commerce of masculinity as what what covered put down. No, I'm not. I'm not translating as that. I'm going by what he's translating. Wit covered put downs. Wit covered put downs. Mm. Well, what if the commerce of masculinity is if someone's has higher commerce, higher higher masculinity social status, a bigger bank account, is they have better wittier put downs. Ask Elon Musk. Sure. But your opinion of this statement? Wit covered put downs. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't live my life to that extent. I, I really don't. I take people for who they are and what they are at that given moment. Um, men, masculinity can be, <clears throat> insecurity can come from a lot of that stuff too. I find with men. Okay, let's play some more is because um, men learn that if you can't handle criticism, you're not going to be successful. There you go. That's partially why with covered put downs are evaluating how much can you handle criticism. That's right. That's something that's more masculine, maybe, right? 
No question. Well, because it means that if something small and upsetting comes along, you're going to get big and upset. It's, it's too dangerous in a crisis. Um, the feeling is that if you can't be teased, you can't be trusted. If you can't be teased, you can't be trusted. It's an invitation to play. It's an mm -hmm. invitation to be. If trusted. you're skilled at it, right? I mean, that's. I mean, a tease can go too far, and then it's insulting. But, Precisely. but the but the really good tease is right on the edge. They're sophisticated enough to know when a comment is right on the edge, and they're resilient enough to tolerate it and respond in kind. So it's an it's a compliment of the highest order to push like that. How about that statement? It's a compliment of the highest order. Respond in kind. So it's an it's a compliment of the highest order to push like that. How's that land, Steve? Ooh. Isn't that uh, how Rome was built? If you can't be teased, you can't be trusted. Maybe. How do you that think it, it for modern society, your family and your interactions with the world? Um yeah, I've always been you know, captain of my teams in sports have been a foreman in my work. Oh, the, the, okay. the one person that people lean to solve problems for. Yeah, I've lived most of my life like that. Yeah. But I was never, I never took those leadership roles. If you can't um, be teased, you can't be trusted. Because it wasn't, it, I was very humble about it. It wasn't because I needed to have that to make myself feel good. I think I was um, going out of service, rescuing. No, not rescuing. I think it just fearless in terms of tackling the situation or getting the job done right. But working with people, like somebody asked me once, "What's it like to be a foreman?" I said, "It's great. I'm one step closer to the door if it doesn't work out." In other words, it's my own responsibility not leaning and blaming others for that responsibility. People would say, well, you're my boss. I said, no, 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 I work with you. I don't, you don't work for me. I have a boss, you know, so, yeah. If you can't be teased, you can't be trusted. I, I find that in, in sports that the biggest leaders um, in that role model are truly probably the most humblest people in the room. They're not the ones that have to talk, but when they do speak, people listen. If you can't be teased, you can't be trusted. Oh, these are nice slogans you're saying. No, I. it's the way I've always kind of seen it in, in some of the entities, even at work. Some of the most humble people are the, the most leadership qualities. We're not talking presidents of the United States or in political power or CEOs of big businesses. I'm talking, we're lawyers arguing about a custody battle, talking about general life. If you can't be teased, <laughs> you can't be trusted. Um, there's something that uh, Pete Walker has as the fawn type. So that's a persona that people shape shift to perform in the world or create a role. And that's... Um, managed by maybe an uh, overactive superego, so a part that controls presentation. It's a common uh, codependent uh, abuse survivor uh, type of social strategy. Okay, so how about this theory, this question? Would it be possible to overmanage uh, as a father? Play on the edge, play on the edge. I don't know. I haven't had that opportunity yet, so I can say. Would it be possible that if you overmanage, you lose the dynamism of just the instinctive masculine leadership uh, sense of adventure? Play on the edge. That could be. Um, I think. I think a lot of fathers that feel like in a divorce or a custody situation feel like they have lost their kids in a way so it does take away the the that spark so it's 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 um a consistent emotional struggle to try to keep as much level ground as possible without creating valleys or, or mountains you know to keep yeah, that structure keeping there. as much structure through over management it might be overusing your managing skills instead of this instinctive, uh, more raw masculine type uh, 
direction. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what if, because you've had this sort of overmanaged uh, protocol that might be attractive to somebody who's been shunned or more or less <laughs> chaotic? Yeah, I was told that many times. Uh -huh. uh, I was called so someone a who's maybe yeah. a woman who's more integrated, yeah. they might not be attracted to this overmanaged uh, intellectual masculine energy, right? I I don't know. I'm not a woman. Um, I can't answer yeah, that. But, sure. But 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 <laughs> in that point of what you're saying, uh, my last situation, you are bang on a hundred percent. Uh -huh. She looked at me as a father figure, somebody who she struggled with in her own relationship. Yes, but one much. that was highly managed and worried about being perfect or taking care of things. Hardworking. Of this, and, yeah. Yeah, hardworking. See, all these uh, yeah. administrative, man, man, managerial, more intellectual, not the, you know, the brute force type of masculine energy. Play on the edge. Play on the edge. Okay, let's play with father energy, because we might dive into that in the after party. It's a real restricting process, and that's why half of the great father is a tyrant. There's no way out of that. You know, like you hope that the whole damn thing isn't a tyrant, because obviously by socializing your children, you're doing them a great favor, right? You're, first of all, they learn how to talk. That's fairly useful. They learn how to read. They learn how to play with other kids. So at the same time that you're constraining the hell out of them and making them less than they were in some ways, you're also opening up vistas to them that they would otherwise not have access to. So I thought this was an interesting framing for uh, father fathering in that it's a process of constraint. So discipline, standards, structure, it's a process of constraining and limiting options, limiting potential. Some, a woman who hears this, or a mother, might see this constraint as uh, antithetical, like, that's not comfort, that's not nurturing, why would this sort of constraint is this restrictive. And so what that is, it's a collapse of potential into actuality. But let's make no mistake about it. So that's part of the goal, collapsing the potential into actuality. So that's where it's sort of problem solving skills. What did you do? Uh, getting things done, repairing structures, that's collapsing potential into actuality working with the objective world. It's costly because you become what you are instead of all the things that you could have been. And people experience that as a cost. That's the story of Peter Pan. I don't want to grow up. One of the things I see in my clients very, very often, and this is more characteristic of the males than the females, um, is that many of them will not allow themselves to experience anger or aggression or to express it because they have tyrannical fathers. You know, and so one of the things they decided when they were like four was, I'm never going to be like that. It's like... Never again identity. Hmm? Well, that doesn't work out because, you know, you need the capacity for anger and hostility and aggression and all that. You have to have that at hand. And you don't fix it by refusing to manifest it. All that does is cripple you, because you know, you're missing half of your emotional dynamism and a whole chunk of your power. You know, you don't have that many sources of power. You've got enthusiasm, that's a good one. Curiosity, interest, appreciation for beauty. You know, anger is unbelievably useful. It's a tremendous reservoir of power, you know, and you don't want to... So what if the role of an ideal father is channeling anger and showing how to own that source of power? Play on the edge. Play on the edge. And if, for whatever reason, society or there's devouring mother energy that's limiting or blocking open access to anger and rage and protective energy, so then you replace it with overmanaging. You replace it with playing safe. You're disconnected from your masculine. Um, Aggression. Play on the edge. 
but it's also your masculine sense of direction, your masculine ability to aim and get things done and solve problems. What did you do? And do crazy stuff and laugh about it, that sort of dynamism. Play on the edge. Press that. You want to harness it so it's at hand so that people don't mess with you. Because they will, you know. People will push, especially pushy people. And if you can't, well, if, if you can't push back, they're going to walk all over you. They won't even notice, you know, because you'll just move. And they won't even notice that they pushed you over. So when you'll go home, you'll be all resentful and irritated and brood on it for a month, and it's like, they didn't even notice anything happened. So lack of a balanced, healthy, ideal father figure that's channeling healthy power through anger play on the edge would be a role model um, that would teach children how to use anger to set boundaries, to protect themselves, to set limits on crazy. Because anger is about boundaries. That's... Anger is always about boundaries. How you set boundaries in such a way that you don't destroy the boundaries of other people. Anger is always about boundaries. How you set boundaries in such a way that you don't destroy the boundaries of other people. Anger. Now, destroying the boundaries of other people, that's the territory of hatred. But anger, <laughs> channeled and skillfully applied is setting boundaries that doesn't destroy other people's boundaries. So what if healthy anger could have been a way to block suicidal ideation and abandonment terror without destroying her boundaries because setting anger to destroy her boundaries led to her destruction of your world. <laughs> uh, well, that's bang on because so that's I, where I was trying to set boundaries and then the rage yes, would come in. Your boundaries killed her boundaries, which caused her to feel abandonment terror. That was part of her boundaries or her enmeshment, her lack of boundaries. Right. The confusion was, is at the beginning when everything was stable, she used to say to my mother too, she says, I have this fear of abandonment. Steve's going to leave me. My mom would say, well, he wouldn't have moved. He wouldn't have done all these things if he was going to leave you. So that 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 is out of my control um but i never i never saw or understood that I, I never encountered that myself in my life so my parents had always been there for me even after their third divorce and whatnot so um but i gotta say like robbie just commented there yeah it hits hard tonight for sure yeah well if she has a terror of abandonment and shunning and it's reasonable that's her narrative that's her boundaries yeah and then if you have a limit on how much you'll be there for those boundaries and you don't articulate that to her in a way where she can have her boundaries and you can have your boundaries that's sort of the missing skill you have that's contributed to the to the disconnect yeah i tried that many times but that was not, that was not, that was not, that was not, not considered. Torn. She wouldn't no. hear, it, right? Mm -hmm. No. So this is where, if you had um, a skill of learning to navigate boundaries and to always be at the edge, play on the edge of boundaries, growing up with other role models and men and father figures, you might have had a broader base of setting boundaries and communicating boundaries. Um, I think this video has an example of that, I hope. <laughs> Tough love. It's, it, there's a conditional element to it, Not and then judgmental love. element. Tough love, but conditional approval as part of total love. So there's a masculine judgmental element of navigating boundaries effectively or efficiently, of sorting out wheat from chaff, of navigating good and bad. Maybe instinctively, not mentally, but instinctively. My son, who's relatively disagreeable, man, he pushed boundaries at every opportunity when he was between two and four. It was really something to behold. He was a force of nature in 
going right up to the line and pushing on it just to see what was going to happen, to see what was going to happen. So if his son was constantly pushing boundaries just to see what was going to happen at a young age. That means he has a lifetime of constantly feeling what the edge of, of multiple things are. Play on the edge. Of feeling out in every environment is going to have a slightly different boundary edge, slightly different limits. Play on the edge. So that becomes a muscle of sensitivity. Play on the edge. So then as an adult, you can now push other people's boundaries. You can now see how much you can push and how much give other people have. And then now you can navigate and negotiate boundaries more skillfully. Play on the edge. But that's like a pre-verbal. It's a intuitive muscle that gets built through just constant use of this uh, boundaries. And not only is it just boundaries, there's also other benefits. I mean, right now, my son and daughter are teaching their son, who's slightly over one, no. And I told them to, how to do it. So, for example, he sits at our table and he reaches behind and he's tearing the plants out of the green wall that's behind him. And so that's a no. And I said, I encouraged them. I said, look, take his hand, hold it firmly so that he can't move it. Say no, hold him until he stops struggling to. Now, someone who doesn't know restraint would need to, oh, this is abusive, but this is communicating to a child through body language <laughs> who doesn't have mental concepts. They're not going to memorize things. So you have to show the no and physically act out the no so they f identify and they link it. If you just physically constantly offer permissiveness <laughs> because of your anxiety, they're going to associate permissiveness in your anxiety. They're not going to learn the no. It's not going to be a solid boundary. Undertake his goal-directed activity. He'll probably cry as soon as he stops resisting, let go and give him a pat. So you do that 20 times. Then when you say no, he'll cry and stop. And then 20 times after that, he'll just stop. He won't cry. So 40 times and you've taught him no, which is an amazing thing because then you can let him go free because whenever you say no, he'll just stop. And so you can facilitate his freedom instead of having to be a helicopter tyrant parent who is one step behind their ambulatory two and a half year old you know, interfering with absolutely everything he does because he can't grasp a basic principle of socialization, a basic principle of socialization in any case. So this is where you're giving them a stronger leash at a younger age because now they can take verbal no's. They can accept verbal rules. They can trust the parent that that's safe, that's unsafe. Versus if you don't do this, uh, gradual process. You can helicopter the kid and then you can constantly judge safety and not safety, but you're doing that for the kid. <laughs> you're co-opting their muscle of navigating, oh, this is how much free space I have and that's dangerous. They have to learn that sometime or shouldn't they? I mean... No has some pain associated with it because otherwise it wouldn't produce tears. And no is a very, very hard thing to learn. No is a very, very hard thing to learn. And no is what the world teaches, not just what people teach. That's the domain of order. And then there's another domain where all hell breaks loose and you don't know what to do. And that's the domain uh -oh. of chaos. But there's an intermediary chaos. where you're expanding your zone of competence through exploration, through exploration. And that's really where consciousness operates. And so this exploration muscle is dynamic teasing. That was the other video I was trying to bring up that play on the edge. The conversation felt a bit lifeless because it didn't have this sort of exploratory teasing energy. It was just, it could have been the emotional fatigue. So maybe that was part of it, but part of masculine energy is this diamondism of navigating and exploring play on the edge sense of adventure, maybe. And that's where we learn. That's where we learn. And so risk-taking behavior isn't exactly risk-taking behavior. It's, it's embeddedness in the zone of proximal development. That's where we learn. The reason for that is that 
well, there's another judgment, which is, well, the risk is worth taking because there's more than one risk at play here. There's the proximal risk that you engage in when you push yourself, but there's the distal risk that you engage in when you don't push yourself. That's where we learn through exploration. That's where we learn. Fruit exploration and wasn't this tough love? Tough love. Tough love. Tough love. So we're programmed to daddy energy about boundaries and navigating uh, limits. So it's a combination of if there's a father scolding you, then it triggers a wire in you that, oh, there's a boundary and there might be a no. So a strong daddy scold is going to trigger like danger, danger. But at the same time, a healthy daddy, a healthy father energy is going to promote teasing sense of humor to play at the edges of thing because it's useful in society to know how to navigate when you can push boundaries and when some boundaries are dangerous this is uh, a very useful social skill your role is to be a proxy for the real world if you're a parent And if you overcoddle, then you're going to weaken the child so they're less prepared for the world. And if you're too neglectful, you're also going to not prepare the child because you're, you're creating more chaos than the real world is, or the real world ends up being an escape or something. So the devouring mother is a trap. This would be an unhealthy version of parenting. <laughs> and the Oedipal mother is the mother that gets too close to her children, right? And intermingles herself with them to too great a degree. You, you had no right. I had every right. I am your mother. You had no right, Rich. I can't taste. I can't smell. I can't even feel the temperature of this room that in her attempts to protect them, undermines them fatally. He can't feel the edges and the limits because the mother overprotected his mother. Won't stop interfering in my life. I was just trying to protect you. And, act and then interference ends up feeling being defined as love by enmeshment interference like all you can ever do is protect them first of all you can't protect people you can only make them strong you can only make them strong it's like never leave me here's the deal i'll do everything for you you just never leave never leave me you know that's sort of somebody who has abandonment terror They're obsessed with this so if you have an, a mothering energy from some other influence that's t saying never leave you might be drawn to this as a new partner because this is very passionate. It is a bit smothering, but if that's all you know. <laughs> that's lovely. Don't run away. I know that you're still angry. I know that how you feel hasn't changed, but I, I want you to... How I feel? I've spent the last 100 years dreaming of this moment. I rehearsed everything I ever wanted to say to you, every word, to every. make you understand exactly what you stole from me. That's it. You cannot protect them. You can make them strong, and then they can protect themselves. But then they don't need you. And there's the underground pathological element of the devouring mother. I don't need you to understand anything. I don't need you at all the story of Mary and the snake in the Garden of Eden. And so Mary has her foot on a serpent and she's holding Christ off to the side like this. Well, that's exactly what mothers have always done is they hold their infants out of the reach of the terrible serpentine predator. But adults aren't infants and neither are children. And if you treat them like they are, you undermine them, undermine them. Because I will never forgive you lifetime that you stole from me.
the standard pathology with mom is she did everything for you. Well, what's left for you to do? Nothing. For the woman who's nothing but nothing. protective mother, there's no role outside of, of nurturant of infants, of nurturer of infants. Well, you just keep them infants. They'll never leave. They might kill you one night in your sleep, but they'll never leave. We've seen me dead. We'll make things right. Oh, this could be triggering. Stop you. Those eyes for people. Yeah. What? No, father! But actually, she doesn't die in the game. Okay. I love you. I think he dies from the other, the god or something. But this is a better ending. <laughs> so if your version of love is protection, and your protection ends up weakening the person that you're protecting, you're undermining their development. Or you're setting them up for a future relationship where someone will destroy all of their finances. Because the real world is uh, much more chaotic and much more... Uh, a lot of dangerous people out there. So a healthy parent in my pitch today is somebody that prepares the child for the real world. And if you're just a permissive parent and you hide behind protection, saving from child abuse and whatever narrative you're making, <laughs> that's about you, it's not about them. Because there's predators out there that's part of this group healing from narcissistic relationships. So my obligation is trying to create this reali reality uh, simulation so that when you go out and have future relationships with future potential predators, you will perform better. Or I can create a simulation where we can make you feel like you're competent here. So I can feel good, and we can feel good, and then you'll fall on your face in the real world, and then you'll go back to another narcissist group, because then you're in that cycle of <laughs> broken person getting healing, getting broken, getting healing, getting broken, healing. and that's the billion dollar self-help industry. So now, after party, I can show you the monkey experiments. <laughs> Does anyone want to see the Monster Monkey Experiment by Harry Harlow? The guy who did the rhesus monkey experiments. That's been the basis of attachment theory. This guy did a cloth monkey and a steel monkey, and the, the monkeys went to the cloth monkey because that was more comforting. And then Harry Harlow got more devious and did a monster monkey, which I thought was... I finally got a good clip of, of that. A monster monkey? I don't remember that. Yes, it's not as popular. It's only the the two monkeys. He actually created these monster monkeys that were... Uh... Mean? Yes. Okay. <laughs> monster mothers. Fake oh, monster poor mothers. Bubbles. Oh, okay, they, they're gone now. They're not alive anymore. Okay. <laughs> and then what's the results? So there's monster monkeys and there's a pit of despair. <laughs> These created two different type of monkeys, which might create two different type of mothers or two different types of parenting. So I thought this was useful for as a metaphor, but it's a bit intense. Oh, Susie wants to see, Marie wants to see. Okay, so the monster monkeys I thought was fun, or Surprising, the results. <laughs> One of his most controversial experiments, and most painful, and, and in its way equally revolutionary, was, what you know, Cloth Mom Gone Psycho, the evil mothers. The Cloth Mom go Gone Psycho. Isn't that a cool <laughs> description? <laughs> 
This is an amazing experiment. The evil mothers looked identical to the cloth models that Harlow had been using for many years. But these mothers were not impassive. Some blasted the baby monkeys with violent jets of air. Others jabbed at them with metal spikes. When the distraught infant would clutch the fake mother, these spikes would come out and repel the infant. Metal spikes. That's a super devious monster mother. For Harlow, having established the love the baby monkeys had for their surrogate mothers, this was his way of finding out if that love could be destroyed. Finding out if that love could be destroyed. They predicted they were going to get some pretty messed up sort of psycho monkeys. They didn't really see that, what they saw. So they thought there'd be psycho monkeys by having a monkey that's attached to the fake mother first, and then having the blades or the blowing air to break the love, but something else happened. Check this out. It was, uh, babies always went back. Babies always went back. For Harlow, this was a revelation that offered a powerful insight into human relationships. It was proof that however badly a mother behaved, the child would always return to her in search of love. Just as we know with abusive, real, I mean human mothers, rejecting uh, and often punitive mothers don't indeed produce independence, they often produce exactly the opposite. Babies always went back, always went back, always went back. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that cool? <laughs> kind of like but mothers the, uh, can... Sorry. Sorry, I'm Molly, just thinking, yeah, mothers can do whatever they want and, and you'll never know they're abused because they'll be clinging to their mothers. Okay, that's just a thought I had. And the infant monkeys were bonded to first. the non-psycho cloth mother first. Yes, then there was the successful is, bonding yeah. first. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think that's Then the monster came key. out, and then that was <laughs> key. So there was bonding first, because the pit of despair monkeys have a different story. I'm waiting for that one. <laughs> that has a rape rack, so that might trigger people. Because <laughs> Harlow uh, got depressed because his wife died from cancer, then he had ECT, electrical shock therapy, and then he had more uh, more devious experiments like the Pit of Despair, which was successful in pointing that out, but the when the Pit of Despair monkeys became mothers, that was very interesting. So this is a double depressing whammy. This was just sort of depressing. So. This is after party, so if you guys stick around, things get depressing or, or funny. Depends on your temperament. <laughs> he allowed the monkeys to form natural happy bonds with their mothers. Then, at anywhere between three months and three years of age. So you need the foundation first. <laughs> then you offer the change. So. Healthy bond first and then pit of despair. He would take these happy monkeys and place them in his most sinister device yet, the pit of despair. Monkeys would be placed alone into these chambers and although they were provided with enough food and water, they would be given no other stimuli. The device itself can be seen as a physical representation of mental anguish. See, so they're stuck in the bottom, they can't climb out, they get food, but slowly this is training them for learned helplessness. This is pretty, this is clever, so if you have your partner that you want to get even with, you can create one of these for them. Or maybe you can do a variation. <laughs> kind of like a functional Edvard Monk painting. 
At first, the monkeys would try to escape the pit, jumping up the sides to get a brief glimpse of the outside world before sliding down to the bottom. But after a few days... This is like complex trauma. So at first you reach out to people and try to make sense of your trauma. But then they say, fuck you, get away from me because your trauma is like two cooties. <laughs> you have this learned helplessness because you lose, you end up being isolated. Or you go to trauma groups and you get new abusers that jump on you. So <laughs> you have this your own pit of despair, not physically, but psychologically from the mental health community. <laughs> they gave up entirely. In Harry's own words, he describes it like this. Most subjects typically assume a hunched position in a corner at the bottom of the apparatus. One might presume at this point that they find their situation to be hopeless. Those that were in the pit for three months, although psychologically devastated, did show some signs of recovery. So three months, you can recover. Six months or longer in the pit pretty much meant irreversible damage. Once they were let out of the pit of despair, life didn't get much easier for the monkeys. So the monkeys, after six months, have irreparable damage. And then we've gone through two plus years of pandemic isolation, so... It's pretty good we haven't gone too cr super crazy. But this is the effects of being trapped in despair. The ones that were in the pit for 12 months or more came out the worst, refusing to eat or move once released. Often they would just starve themselves to death. Harry wanted to test the effects that clinical depression would have on the parental instincts of the female monkeys, but after a stint in the pit they refused to mate ever again. Oh, this part is the devious part. <laughs> This is pretty amazing, what happens. To solve this problem, Harry invented a new apparatus. This was a metal frame that the female monkeys would be tied to in a mating position, allowing a pack of male monkeys to Hello, mate with her freely. This did result in pregnancies. However, the results were pretty horrifying. If the mothers didn't simply neglect their children, they outright tortured them. As Harry outright torture, to what extent was the torture of the monkeys who were lost in their despair? He says, not even in our most devious dreams could we have designed a surrogate as evil as the real monkey mothers were. In one case, a mother held her child's face to the floor whilst she chewed off its fingers and toes. Chewed off fingers and toes in this position. In another case, the mother deliberately crushed her baby's skull. Skull crushing. Oh, that was it. <laughs> fingers and toes. In another case, the mother deliberately crushed her baby's skull. So I would link this to codependents who deal with sadistic mothers who through their own despair or hatred of the world or hatred of life they learn to hate their inner child so then when they had a real child that same hatred <laughs> got acted out on the external child because they they rejected they self-hated their inner child because they grew up through neglect or some sort of wiring defect but he was able to duplicate it by putting healthy monkeys into a pit of despair where they lost interest in life and interest in breeding and then forced them to breed and mother and then they did this level of psychopathic destruction And then if you're the other side, if you're the baby that's getting beaten up, if you had that short period of maternal bonding, then you're falling into that evil monster mother where you just keep going back for love. Her 
Hurt monkeys, hurt monkeys. Ha ha ha. And then this is a lighter version of just neglected monkeys. I forgot what this says. Harlow's early experiments were having consequences he hadn't predicted. The monkeys that he had raised using wire and cloth surrogates were experiencing difficulties. It was so obvious these animals wouldn't. Oh, this could be a metaphor for, for codependents in general that don't have proper parenting and they're neglected or they had to parentify, they had to be parents for their parents so they didn't get to socialize right. So what happens is this. Not socially normal. They would say cower in the corner and they'd rocking and the others would start jumping on. If they would just stay still, just stay still, then the other monkeys would leave them alone. But they didn't know how. Raised by impassive mothers made out of cloth and wire, the baby monkeys had never learned to socialize nor experience rejection. Sometimes they harmed themselves and as adults showed no interest in breeding. Harlow responded by creating what he described as the rape rack, on which females were forced to mate against their will. At that point, I wondered about what he was doing, and I thought it isn't so much that he hates the animals, but I think he wanted to do something that was going to shock. The disturbed monkeys. Oh. So the neglected mothers still did the damage. Maybe they didn't need the pit of despair. Interesting. Forced to breed on the rape rack simply became disturbed parents. They abused their babies and sometimes even killed them. So the despair monkeys did the extreme abuse, but even the neglected monkeys, who maybe became narcissists, did lighter forms of abuse. But then if you had like more despair and more self-hate or more lack of socialization, then you take it upon the baby. Because if you, so if you grew up and then you had uh, neglect and then you blame the world or you couldn't make sense of it, then you have a kid that's extremely needy on you where you didn't think the world was fair, where you got attention, you you were you hated the world because of neglect, or you blame someone. <laughs> so then you have this bundle of joy that is constantly needy, because that's what babies are, by definition, right? You're sadistic in your resentment about how you didn't get neglect, and now you have this, or you didn't get attention, now you have this attention whore as your kid. Then you take it out on the kid. You don't even need extreme despair. You just need to grow up with neglect, <laughs> envy. And then when you have a kid, then you take out that envy and resentment onto your kid. Monkey experiments. That's some heavy shit. <laughs> that is some serious heavy shit. But I have to admit, it would explain a lot. Maybe it um, uh, would explain some of the things why maybe what I just experienced. I don't know. Who fucking knows, but Jesus Christ. <laughs> Off the charts. <laughs> well, the monster monkey experiment is kind of cool. Or the evil mother. If you're a baby, you don't know what... Uh, you don't have a map of 
comparable love and hate. So if you're getting spikes in air or rejection from your mother, it's still attention. It's still care. It's still life force. So then if you're getting life force from your mother and it's hatred and whatever, it's intense, and you don't know any different, then that's what you associate as intense love. And if you have a mother that gaslights a story that creates a language of agency of how you can achieve something or do something or whatever, then you can fall into that story and you try to pursue approval or a pursue some sort of belonging from this rejecting, punishing, crazy mother. So, and it's more addictive than a normal mother because that intensity of the punishment and the intermittent nature of it makes it highly addictive. So that, that would explain some of my situation. No question when the way it's being explained there and the way that's being explained by you, which I, I just can't relate to. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. It would explain, but you can't relate to. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, I understand how it's explained, but I just, I just don't think that way. Never experienced that. Um, so yeah, it's mind bending. Uh. Well, this is sort of trying to explain how we operate in love pre-verbally, not something that we think rationally. Love is just passion. It's just pain and pleasure. So a child doesn't have the mental models or the stories. It's just care, attention, positive and negative care is better than no care. So, so that would explain somebody who's BDP, why they say that it's a child's mind and an adult's body. Yeah, so if you had someone with a extreme borderline who has abandonment terror and is very desperate, they're operating out of pre-verbal pure desperation. Uh, and actually, desperation is a higher high. So that's this pointer I had. Um, the feeling where it starts declining a little bit, it's declining a little bit, it's declining a little bit. The feeling where it starts declining a little bit, it's declining a little bit, it's declining a little bit. The feeling where it starts the, the feeling where it starts declining a little. So that's a high from drugs, but it's also a metaphor for the decline of about to get abandoned, or the relationship is about to fall apart. That actually feels more intense. That feels more alive. So it's a sort of love-hate relationship with abandonment terror that makes it so juicy, that makes it so enticing. But ultimately, in the end, it is it, it, they hate their lives themselves. Like consistent, it's where the suicidal tendencies come from. They, they're well, they're their own. rational mind can't make sense of it, so they might judge themselves. Like so if they take agency for their their heart that loves the highs and the lows and the decline, then it doesn't make sense in their head. <laughs> yeah, because I, I never heard in my life when someone said to me, she'd say, I, I almost put you on a pedestal. And I was like, what the fuck is that? Like, I don't get that. I just thought it's someone that's just truly fallen in love and humbly because you're a good person, you do good things but not understanding the psychology part of it where I should have fucking started Googling some of this shit real quick. And I could have got out of there a lot sooner. <laughs> Unreal. Yes. In the ideal world, but usually it never happens that way. <laughs> you don't know what it's like until you experience it. Uh... They do offer you a shadow integration. So they evoke wounds from your childhood and stir things up and destroy your map of the world, which allows you to rebuild yourself with a more 
diverse, stronger uh, foundation. Well, they say your villains are your teachers. See? So you just have to learn how to get to that point. <laughs> you got the pointer, but the pointer is just an empty word. You have to learn how to integrate your villains and turn well, them into a teacher. I've got I've got most of that stuff down. It's just that the, oh, the cleanup, okay. the cleanup part of it is the prolonging part of it that's not allowing me to get to move my life 100 percent forward. That's that's the hard part right now. That's it. The cleanup. Is there a particular issue in the cleanup, or just yeah. cleanup in general? No. <laughs> Legalities. Oh, the legal cleanup. You think that after that's done, you're good? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I understand. Well, well, who knows in the future, but I can tell you this. If I ever hear fear of abandonment again or any of these things, I know one thing. I'll be a yeah, waiter. Check. Get the fuck out of there. That's for sure. Oh. Never again. Yeah. <laughs> never again is right. You've fallen for the never again uh, response. Yeah, that's... A lot of people go through that phase. Then you have to go find a positive thing. But right now, you're in your, in your period. Uh, never again is pretty normal. I didn't even get to play the parent video. I wanted to play this, but I couldn't set it up. So let's throw this out here blind. Some parenting skills are hard to test, like teaching your children to think critically. So this is a pretty cool TV series. I think it's from Australia or something or somewhere else. But they test different parenting styles and see which ones have the children go to the predator and which ones don't. <laughs> and to make the best decisions when you're not around. Every parent wonders whether their kids know how to act with strangers. So we sent your children to the park with danger, a danger. and we hired an actor to approach them. We teach our kids to be wary of strangers. So this is the strict authoritative, authoritarian, hyper rule doctrine children. Hello. They would be courteous and polite. How are you going? Good. Yeah. But if they began to feel uncomfortable about the situation, what we expect them to do with a stranger is retreat fairly quickly to a safe place. They look confident, right? Look at how much they're memorizing stuff and how tense they are because they're just memorizing a bunch of rules. <laughs> Watch how they react when they see the results. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Hello. Cute Can puppy. I give him a pat? Yeah, you can give him a pat. <laughs> hey, look at that. Timothy, you careful. You want to give him a treat? See if he can sit. Sit. Say sit, Charlie. Sit. Oh, there you go. Nice work. <laughs> Guess what? What? Charlie's just had puppies. <laughs> puppies. Oh, oh. Puppies. Tiny puppies? They're just over there. If you want to come have a look at them. Where are they? Just over there. Just over the behind the chair. Little pup. Do they look confident? Are they worried? <laughs> will the ch will their children listen to their rules, or will the children be drawn by puppies just over there in the car, away from your babysitter? It's just over there. You want to go? No, okay. No, Where are they? Let's go have a look at them. You want to give him another treat? Yeah. Yeah, here you go. Can I get there? Their children failed. 
be so <sighs> just angry that someone would ever do that to a child. And oh, blame the bad guy. Don't blame their untested rule setup. <laughs> and that's just an act of it. I'm just like, it was as a dad doing things to me about in, the, in, that, in that scenario. Um, yeah. I think maybe to be overly authoritarian could result in your kids having a sort of misunderstanding. They might think all oh, adults are in charge. And... Well, look at these two gay therapists or social workers. Look how judgmental they are. What do you think their kids do? We're going to find out how their kids do. <laughs> Too judgmental is bad. Okay. You might trust more than... Than they should. Yeah. Our children interact with a lot of adults. We encourage them to be polite and friendly and to respect authority. We, we mentioned respect of authority, obedience. It's really difficult for a kid, let alone five-year-old kid, to tell a part, ah, I know it's Safe authority, enough. but uh, okay. I have a, a gut feeling, so. A bigger picture of our evolving strict parenting approach is to, to teach children to be responsible to a set of values. It's not just about, it's not about obedience. Our, our, our end goal is responsibility to a, to a set of values that they own and they work out in their life. But an internalised Internalised, yeah. Not, not obedience to what? Where is the awareness of your environment? Fuck that, just memorise values. <laughs> Someone tells you to do. Brett and Tony, let's see how you're for. They got four kids. A gay couple. How did their kids do? Boys went. We've had many conversations with the boys about if they are approached by a stranger, really, that they need to not engage, really. But I think in many ways, because we are in a regional community, we are in a sort of cocoon of love. Hey, guys. They're in a cocoon of love. <laughs> They've had many conversations. How do their kids perform? How are you going? Good. Good. Do you like dogs? I think we have felt that because there is four, there is a bit of a safety in numbers. Someone's not going to take all four. Can I pet this? your dog? Of course you can. Tiny. You're so soft. She is, isn't she? She actually just had a few little puppies. I've got a few of them over in the car. Do you want to come see them? Uh -huh. They're puppies. so cute. Unbelievably cute. Do you want to get the other guys? Do you want to come check out the puppies? Okay. Tony. He has puppies. Did you want to come and see the puppies? A few puppies. Sure. All good. <laughs> They're just over here. I like it. Have you got a like, favorite type of dog? Oh, yeah, I've got my favorite type of dog. See how anxious the parents are? That's their enmeshment smothering energy. They don't trust their kids, or they're imagining what might happen. Oh yeah, I've got my favourite type of dog, Fidget. Fidget. You should see the size of these little ones. They're like half the size of her, they're so cute. Brett and I are very fearful, probably because I'm a social worker, he's a teacher. We hear about these stories all the time. Social worker and teacher professionals and expert at social work and education and they their kids failed we're all questioning right now it doesn't matter if you've had the conversation or not what the kids will do in a situation like that we've had many conversations about stranger danger but we probably have have sort of had that um, false sense of security because too demonized if you demonize the person as too easy to spot, this doesn't prepare you. You have to be able to spot deception and be aware, or just be skeptical. Lirin and Richard, here are two of your children at the park. We don't really want to make our children afraid of everybody. These are nature parents. They're sort of earthy. How do their kids do? In the world that they don't know personally. I'm the bee. Wee! But at the same time, there are some adults out there who think it's funny to scare kids. Come on, let's go over. And so that's what I told them. It doesn't make the world a scary place to them, but it also forewarns them that not everybody is going to be friendly. 
They're I think pretty Jojo confident. wants the pat. Do you want to pat Jojo? I we'll can. see. Yeah, she's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, she's three years old, the little one. She's tiny. She's just had a few few puppies actually. I've got the puppies in the in the car. You, you think she's cute? They're cute. Puppies. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. Would, would you like to come see the puppies? Okay. Yeah. Oh, come on, Jojo. Go on this way. I'll just tell now. Oh, that's okay. If, if you just want to come see, it's just this car here. Okay. Let's go. Is this way. Mm -hmm. We're just going to see the puppies in that car. Oh. Not far. And we might leave it. What do you think? Yeah? Yeah. Big sigh of relief there. Your child, which is interesting when we look at your parenting style, sought approval from the nanny before heading off. Part of being close to nature is listening to your instincts and our children instinctively go, here is someone who is older and is here to look after me. It's definitely worthwhile helping our children to develop and listen to their instincts. Teaching children to develop their own critical thinking skills is invaluable. It helps them to deal with the challenges that life throws at them, especially when parents aren't around. You can encourage critical thinking in your children by pretend play and role plays, oh, or by see? simply giving them pretend real life play. situations and saying, what would you do if you were in this situation? So teasing and playing to see the edges of danger and safety through feeling it out and judging, evaluating different circumstances versus memorizing a bunch of values or versus memorizing all these dangerous spots. You need environmental awareness, right? But they have some other uh, series like going to buy ice cream and returning money, all these different tests to see how the kids perform and how the different uh, parenting styles work. And again, it's a simulation. If you want to see scarier stuff, you can watch that To Catch a Predator. Are they still showing that show? <laughs> Or you can be one of the fake predators. Some people are, are, they hire like a 17, 18 year old and then that person goes there and then there's people that spy and they report those people to the, the police. They're that service. <laughs> 